Hello everybody, today we have a lecture about endoscopy and bariatric surgery. Okay doctor, you can start now. The performance of bariatric weight loss surgery is escalating in response to the obesity epidemic, with multiple surgical procedures being available. Bariatric surgical procedures currently performed in the United States include, Rho NY gastric bypass, vertical banded gastroplasty, laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, Sleeve gastrectomy. Sleeve gastrectomy with duodenal switch. Lap mini gastric bypass surgery. In the past, many of the complications following bariatric surgery were managed with operation, which was often associated with significant morbidity. In many cases, therapeutic endoscopy permits a less invasive approach to the treatment of post-surgical complications. As a result, Gastrointestinal endoscopists are becoming increasingly involved in the care of bariatric surgery patients. Doctor, what are the indications of endoscopy in bariatric surgery? Endoscopy plays an important role in the evaluation and management of postoperative upper gastrointestinal symptoms and complications following bariatric surgery. Commonly encountered symptoms include abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and dysphagia. Less common symptoms include weight regain, heartburn, regurgitation, hematemesis, and melena. The etiology of these symptoms can be multifactorial and frequently involves non-compliance with prescribed food choices and eating behaviors. An evaluation with endoscopy and or radiographic imaging is warranted to identify a source and exclude structural complications in patients with GI bleeding, biliary obstruction, or symptoms that persist despite counseling and behavior modification. Endoscopy has the added benefit of potentially providing therapy. Evaluation is particularly important in patients who present within the first three to six postoperative months, since this is when the majority of postoperative complications occur. Doctor, what are the preparation for endoscopy? Endoscopists should adhere to the following general principles when performing endoscopy in bariatric surgery patients. Be familiar with the specific surgical procedure performed and the expected post-surgical anatomy. Operative reports should be reviewed, and direct communication with the surgeon is advisable whenever possible. Review all relevant post-operative imaging studies. Select the appropriate endoscopic equipment and accessories based upon the indication for the procedure and information gathered from the investigations. Other considerations include the sedation and analgesia plan, and the appropriate venue for the procedure endoscopy suite versus operating room. These decisions should take into account the patient's comorbidities, the acuity and severity of the postoperative complication, and the complexity of the planned endoscopic procedure. Doctor. What about the equipment? The choice of endoscope and accessories is determined by the indication for the procedure, the likely need for therapeutic intervention, and the patient's post-surgical anatomy. A standard upper endoscope can be used to evaluate patients following purely restrictive procedures such as vertical banded gastroplasty and laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. This also applies to row and y gastric bypass cases in which the gastric pouch or the proximal row limb is being examined. However, a pediatric colonoscope or enteroscope may be needed to examine the jejunal anastomosis, depending upon the length of the row limb. Retrograde evaluation of the biliopancreatic limb and bypassed stomach is challenging in patients who have undergone REB, but can be accomplished in some cases with a pediatric colonoscope or an enteroscope. Deep small bowel enteroscopy has been used to examine the bypassed stomach in patients who have undergone REB. The reported success rates have been as high as 88%, even in patients who have undergone long limb up to 150 centimeters reeb. Methods for deep small bowel enteroscopy include double balloon enteroscopy, single balloon enteroscopy, and spiral enteroscopy. Balloon assisted enteroscopy uses balloons attached to an overtube with or without a balloon at the tip of the enteroscope. 
the balloons anchor the enteroscope, and over tube as the enteroscope is advanced through the small bowel. With spiral enteroscopy, a spiral over tube is placed over the enteroscope. As the spiral is rotated, the small bowel is pulled onto the over tube, advancing the enteroscope through the small bowel. Deep small bowel enteroscopy can also facilitate the performance of endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography in patients with rho NY anatomy. However, this technique is not widely available outside of specialty centers. Doctor, what about the expected findings? For rho NY gastric bypass. The expected endoscopic findings after REB include abnormal esophagus and gastroesophageal junction. Examination of the stomach is limited to the gastric pouch, which varies in size, but is typically short, approximately 5 cm long, and has a small volume, less than 30 ml. The gastrojejunal anastomosis, or stoma, is generally 10 to 12 mm in diameter and should easily permit the passage of a diagnostic endoscope without resistance. Distal to the anastomosis is a short, blind limb of jejunum alongside the efferent row limb, resulting in the shepherd's hook configuration. The length of the row limb is variable, now typically ranging from 100 to 150 centimeters. However, in the distal bypass modification, the row limb is extremely long, as the biliopancreatic limb is connected to the ileum approximately 150 centimeters proximal to the ileocecal valve. It is important that the endoscopist carefully review the operative report and or speak with the surgeon in the setting of distal gastric bypass, as there can be considerable variation in the limb lengths between surgeons and centers. The endoscopic findings in the bypassed stomach have not been well characterized due to technical difficulties in reaching the bypassed stomach. Based upon studies using double balloon enteroscopy, the majority of bypassed stomachs demonstrate gastritis, erosive, erythematous atrophic, or hemorrhagic, even in patients with a normal preoperative endoscopy. The clinical significance of the gastritis is uncertain. For vertical banded gastroplasty, the endoscopic findings after VPG include a normal esophagus and gastroesophageal junction, followed by a vertically oriented pouch along the lesser curvature of the stomach. The banded stoma at the distal end of the pouch is typically 7 to 8 centimeters distal to the GEJ and approximately 10 to 12 millimeters in diameter. Once traversed, the unaltered distal stomach and duodenum can be examined in the usual manner. Retroflexion of the endoscope within the distal stomach reveals the gastric partition and greater curvature and the scope tip can be pulled in to examine the gastric fundus. For laparoscopic adjustable gastric bandling, Laparoscopic gastric bandling is a purely restrictive procedure that compartmentalizes the upper stomach by placing a tight, adjustable prosthetic band around the entrance to the stomach. Endoscopy reveals a variable degree of extrinsic, circumferential compression on the proximal stomach or gastric cardia, usually within a few centimeters of the GEJ. The remainder of the upper gastrointestinal tract should appear normal. For sleeve gastrectomy, Sleeve gastrectomy results in a long, tubular conduit along the lesser curvature of the stomach. A duodenal switch is frequently performed in conjunction with sleeve gastrectomy, which creates a duodenoidal anastomosis visible just distal to the intact gastric pylorus. Doctor, what about the abnormal endoscopic findings? Various complications may be seen on endoscopy following rho NY gastric bypass, vertical banded gastroplasty. Laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, lag, duodenal switch, and sleeve gastrectomy. These include the following, all of which are discussed below, stomal stenosis, stomal and or pouch dilation, gastrogastric fistula band erosion, unraveled suture material, esophageal dilation, marginal ulcers, predictors of abnormal findings, Parameters that are predictive of abnormal endoscopic findings include the symptoms reported, the time since the patient's surgery, and patient. Related risk factors and exposures. Symptoms. Approximately 30 to 45 percent of REB patients who undergo diagnostic endoscopy for evaluation of symptoms have normal post-surgical findings. Symptoms that have been associated with abnormal endoscopic findings include dysphagia, nausea, vomiting, and upper gastrointestinal bleeding. Time since surgery. In general, 
the longer the intervals in surgery, the greater the likelihood of a patient having a normal endoscopy with the possible exception of patients with staple line dehiscences, who more frequently present later in the post-operative course. In a study of 49 symptomatic patients, 85% had abnormal endoscopic findings within the first six post-operative months compared with 47% of patients evaluated after six months. Stomal stenosis should be suspected in patients who present with nausea, vomiting, and or dysphagia. However, the positive predictive value of these symptoms for stomal stenosis is only 40%. The absence of these symptoms essentially rules out the diagnosis. Stomal stenosis typically occur within 3 to 6 months following surgery. The time course was illustrated in a prospective study of 400 re patients who underwent routine endoscopy regardless of symptoms following surgery at 1 month and again after a mean of 17 months. Stomal stenoses were diagnosed and treated in 25% of patients at 1 month and in none of the patients at the second examination. The majority of stenoses were mild, stomal diameter of 7 to 9 mm, and nearly 30% of patients with stomal stenosis were asymptomatic. Stomal stenosis is diagnosed when there is resistance to the passage of a standard diagnostic upper endoscope through the gastrojejunal anastomosis with Reeb or the pouch outlet with VBG. Doctor, what about endoscopic management of stomal stenosis? Endoscopic dilation is first-line treatment for stomal stenosis in most patients with Reeb because endoscopic dilation using through the scope, TTS, balloons or wire-guided bougie dilators is safe and highly effective. The majority of cases can be successfully treated within 1-3 to three dilation sessions, and surgical revision is rarely necessary. The optimal technique remains to be determined. TTS balloon dilators are generally preferred given their ease of use, safety, and the ability to perform multiple dilations under direct endoscopic visualization without the need to repeatedly intubate the esophagus. The primary goal of dilation therapy is symptom resolution, which can usually be obtained at a stomal diameter of 10 to 12 millimeters. The size of the balloon or bougie used to perform dilation therapy should be guided by factors such as the severity of the stenosis, the time since surgery, the size of the initial anastomosis, and the presence of marginal ulceration. Most recent studies describing the use of balloon dilators in this setting have utilized balloons ranging from 10 to 18 millimeters, with some suggesting an optimal goal of 15 millimeters. Very tight stenosis should be gradually dilated over multiple sessions using progressively larger dilators and generally adhering to the rule of threes, dilating no more than 3 mm or 3 FR sizes in a single session. Endoscopists should exercise caution when attempting to pass a balloon dilator beyond a tight stenosis after re because of the short blind stump of jejunum immediately and sometimes directly beyond the gastrojejunal anastomosis. In these situations, Guide wire assisted balloon or bougie dilation under fluoroscopic guidance may be necessary. Additional techniques that may improve the effectiveness and durability of dilation therapy for stomal stenosis include glucocorticoid injection and the removal of suture material at the site of the stenosis, although the benefit of these maneuvers has not been studied rigorously. Short term stenting has also been used to successfully treat stomal stenosis that are refractory to repeated dilation sessions but complications such as pain and stent migration are common. In rare instances, needle knife electrocautery incision can be used to cut open a completely obstructed stoma. Perforation has been reported in up to 2 to 3 percent of patients undergoing dilation for stomal stenosis. The risk can be minimized by starting with a dilator that is only slightly larger than the diameter of the stoma and increasing the size gradually. Avoidance of overly aggressive dilation will also reduce the risk of creating an excessively large stoma, which can potentially contribute to weight regain and dumping syndrome. Doctor, what about stomal and or pouch dilation? Weight regain after bariatric surgery can be attributed to several mechanisms, most commonly a lack of compliance with programmatic diet and exercise. An excessively wide stoma or dilated pouch may contribute to weight regain after Reber VPG surgery by allowing more liberal food intake, although the significance of these findings, particularly stomal dilation, remains a matter of debate. A dilated stoma may also contribute to postprandial dumping syndrome by allowing a rapid passage of food into the small bowel. Doctor, what about endoscopic treatment for pouch dilatation? 
endoscopic reduction of dilated stomas and pouches has been attempted using sclerosants and suturing devices. Injecting sodium muriate circumferentially around the stoma has been used to induce fibrosis and tissue retraction. In a series of 23 patients, this relatively simple technique resulted in the successful reduction of the stomal diameter to 12 mm or less along with a loss of 75% or more of regained weight in 18 patients, 64%. Patients underwent a mean of 2.3 treatment sessions, resulting in an average decrease in stoma diameter from 17 mm to 13 mm, with an average weight loss of 22 kg. A successful reduction of stomal diameter with subsequent weight loss can also be achieved using endoscopic suturing devices, although this is a technically challenging technique with questionable long-term durability. A pilot study demonstrated the successful reduction of enlarged gastric pouches and stomas in 17 of 20 rib patients using a novel endoscopic suturing and full thickness tissue placating platform. The average weight loss after a technically successful procedure was 9 kg at 3 months, compared with an average weight gain of 5 kg in the patients in whom placations could not be placed. Long-term follow-up data are awaited. In addition to possibly helping with weight loss, a reduction of the stoma may also benefit patients with intractable dumping syndrome. Doctor, what about fistulae and leaks after bariatric surgery? Gastrogastric fistulae, gastrocutaneous fistulae, and gastric leaks can result from staple line dehiscence or an incomplete division of the stomach during pouch creation. Complications of gastrogastric fistulae in patients who have undergone rebra VPG include weight regain, marginal ulcers, and heartburn. While a large dehiscence or fistula is easily identified and may even allow passage of the endoscope into the bypassed slash defunctionalized segment, a small dehiscence or fistula may have the appearance of a small diverticulum and can be easily overlooked. Doctor, what about endoscopic closure of the fistula? Endoscopic approaches to correcting gastrogastric fistulae, gastrocutaneous fistulae, gastric leaks, and staple line dehiscences have generally employed a combination of endoscopic suturing hemoclips, covered stents, and fiber and glue. Long-term durability of endoscopic suturing techniques has been disappointing, especially for larger defects, and a standardized technique has not been established. A pilot study using a novel permanent full-thickness tissue opposition system in combination with mucosectomy produced a successful closure of five gastrogastric fistulae in four rib patients. However, only 20% remained closed at three months and none were closed at six months. There is accumulating experience with the off-label use of covered esophageal self-expanding metal stents SEMS, or self-expanding plastic stents SEPS, to treat acute leaks and chronic gastrogastric fistulae complicating bariatric surgery. In one study, 21 patients, 8 rib, 8 sleeve gastrectomy with duodenal switch, 4 sleeve gastrectomy alone. One biliopancreatic diversion under one stent therapy for large anastomotic leaks. Stent therapy alone resulted in primary closure in 13 of 21 patients, 62% after a median of 62 days, range 35-214. A second study involved 19 patients with anastomotic complications after rebirth sleeve gastrectomy, 11 of whom had acute leaks. Stent therapy achieved healing rates of 89% of acute leaks after a mean of 33 days and allowed immediate oral nutrition in 65% of patients. Complications of stent therapy include stent migration, gastrointestinal bleeding, and pain. In addition, tissue hyperplasia within the interstices of the uncovered portions of stems can make subsequent stent removal difficult and traumatic. Although temporary stenting appears to offer a promising alternative to major revisional surgery for anastomotic leaks in fistulae, firm conclusions cannot be drawn yet regarding safety, effectiveness, and optimal treatment protocol. Fiber and glue application is another technique that has been used in small series to successfully close fistulae after bariatric surgery, either alone or in conjunction with other techniques such as hemoclipping, suturing, and stents. Finally, there are a few case series describing the successful endoscopic closure of gastrocutaneous fistulae with a novel biomaterial derived from prosine's small intestine that stimulates fibroblast proliferation and serves as a scaffold for host cells to replace or repair damaged tissue. 
commercially available as sheets that can be cut into small strips or as a preformed cone-shaped plug, this biomaterial. Doctor, what about band erosion as a complication of gastric band? Intergastric band erosion is a potential complication of lag, VBG, and vertical banded gastric bypass, a modification of gastric bypass in which a elastic ring is placed around the pouch to reinforce the stoma. Although uncommon, band erosion should be suspected in patients who regain weight after VBG or lag. Band erosion can also result in abdominal pain, vomiting, gastrointestinal bleeding, intra-abdominal abscess, or fistula formation. In many cases, the first sign of band erosion is infection, cellulitis, at the site of the subcutaneous access port. Doctor, any role for endoscopy for gastric band erosion? The classic treatment for band erosion is the surgical removal of the eroded band, with or without a revisional bariatric operation. However, surgical therapy can be very complicated secondary to a significant inflammatory reaction involving the proximal stomach and left lobe of the liver. Successful endoscopic management of this complication has been described with a variety of techniques designed to transect the eroded band, including the use of North Dakota. YAG laser, endoscopic scissors, and band cutters. Most authors suggest endoscopic removal only if the buckle of the band is visible endoscopically, it is eroded through the gastric wall. A two-step technique has been described utilizing temporary self-expanding plastic stent placement to promote full intergastric migration of the band by causing pressure-induced necrosis between the band and gastric wall, followed by band transection and extraction. Band transection is accomplished under endoscopic control by threading and gripping the band with a guide wire that is progressively tightened to cut the band. Doctor, what does that mean unraveled suture material after gastric bypass surgery? Unraveled non-absorbable suture material within the lumen of the gastrojejunal anastomosis following REB can result in pain, marginal ulcers, and obstructive symptoms secondary to food entrapment slash bezer formation. Endoscopic approach. Treatment of unraveled non-absorbable suture material is only required in patients who are symptomatic. Removal can be accomplished by cutting the suture material with endoscopic scissors and then extracting it with biopsy or rat-toothed forceps. Although the clinical relevance of suture erosion is not always clear, one case series reported symptom resolution or improvement in over 80% of patients after removal of the eroded sutures. Doctor, what about esophageal dilation after bariatric surgery? Megesophagus or pseudotalasia syndrome has been reported as a potential complication of lag. This complication is not managed endoscopically. Doctor, what about marginal ulcers and acute gastrointestinal bleeding after bariatric surgery? Upper gastrointestinal GI bleeding occurs in approximately 1 to 4% of patients after Rowan Y gastric bypass, Reeb, 61-65. Early postoperative hemorrhage, typically defined as GI bleeding occurring within 48 hours after surgery usually arises from the staple lines, gastric pouch, gastric remnant, or anastomosis, gastrojejunostomy, jejunojejunostomy, 62. Marginal ulcers should be considered in patients who present with bleeding after the early postoperative period. Marginal ulcers occur at an anastomosis and, in the case of an reeb, are typically located on the jejunal side of the gastrojejunal anastomosis, picture 7. They may be associated with stomal stenosis or occur at sites where suture material is present. See Complications of Bariatric Surgery, Section on Marginal Ulcers. Marginal ulcers typically occur early in the post-operative course. A study of 441 patients who underwent routine endoscopy, that is, regardless of symptoms, following re at one month, and again after a mean of 17 months found that the majority of marginal ulcers developed within the first four weeks of surgery, 66. Early marginal ulcers occurred in 4 to 12 percent, depending upon the type of operation, while late marginal ulcers occurred in less than 1 percent. Cigarette smoking is a significant risk factor for marginal ulcers after REB, 7,67, 68. Other risk factors that have been identified include Helicobacter pylori infection, 7,69-71, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and said, use, 7, while the use of proton pump inhibitors appears to be protective, 7. Doctor, 
What about endoscopic management of bleeding after bariatric surgery? Endoscopic management of acute GI bleeding in the early post-operative period can be challenging because of the risk of disrupting the still immature staple lines and anastomosis, as well as the relative inaccessibility of the jejuna jejunostomy and bypassed stomach. Thus, therapeutic endoscopy should be reserved for patients who manifest significant hemorrhage and fail to respond to supportive therapy. For patients who require endoscopy, it may be prudent to perform the procedure in the operating room with the patient under general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation. This approach reduces the risk of aspiration and permits immediate operative intervention should endoscopic therapy fail. Successful endoscopic therapy of early postoperative bleeding arising from the gastric pouch, gastrojejunostomy, or jejunojejunostomy has been described in case reports and series. Standard hemostatic modalities, such as epinephrine injection, thermal therapy, and mechanical ligation with hemoclips, can be safely used in this setting. The largest study included 30 patients with intraoperative, immediate, within 4 hours of surgery, or early postoperative upper GI bleeding after laparoscopic REB, 27 of whom underwent endoscopy. Endoscopic intervention was performed in 23 patients, 85%, using epinephrine injection, heater probe, hemoclips, or a combination of these modalities. Rebleeding rates were high, with 16 patients, 59%, experiencing a second episode of bleeding, 5 of whom required repeat endoscopy, and 3 patients experiencing a third episode. No patients required operation, and there were two procedure-related complications, aspiration and perforation at the gastrojejunostomy. Patients with bleeding related to a marginal ulcer are treated like other patients with peptic ulcer bleeding. Chilidocolithiasis and other biliary tract complications. Rapid weight loss is a risk factor for gallstones. However, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography ERCP, after re presents a significant technical challenge because the major papilla is not readily accessible via the peroral approach using standard ERCP equipment. Doctor. What about cholelithiasis and other biliary tract complications? Rapid weight loss is a risk factor for gallstones. However, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography ERCP, after re presents a significant technical challenge because the major papilla is not readily accessible via the peroral approach using standard ERCP equipment. Doctor, can you please tell us summary and recommendations? Several complications of bariatric surgery can be managed endoscopically, reducing or even eliminating the need for high-risk operation. In patients with evidence of gastrointestinal GI bleeding or biliary obstruction, or whose symptoms persist despite counseling and behavior modification, and evaluation with endoscopy, a neuroradiographic imaging is warranted to identify a source and exclude structural complications. Abnormal endoscopic findings following bariatric surgery include stomal stenosis, stomal inner pouch dilation, staple line dehiscences, gastrogastric fistulae, band erosion, unraveled suture material, esophageal dilation, and marginal ulcers. Therapeutic endoscopy is frequently used to manage acute GI bleeding and stomal stenosis following bariatric surgery. Novel endoscopic techniques are also employed to treat stoma and pouch dilation fistulae, band erosion, and biliary complications. Endoscopic dilation, preferably with through the scope balloon dilators, is safe and effective therapy for stomal stenosis or an anastomotic stricture. Emerging endoscopic techniques, such as endoscopic suturing slash tissue application devices and novel implementation of existing technology, stents, fiber and glue, may offer less invasive approaches to the management of anastomotic leaks, fistulae, staple line dehiscences, and stomal and pouch dilation. Acute gastrointestinal bleeding after bariatric surgery can be treated with standard endoscopic hemostasis modalities, including injection therapy, electrocoagulation, and hemoclipping. The primary challenge in performing endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography ERCP, after REB is accessing the region of the major papilla. Various techniques are being devised to address this problem. Thanks, Dr. Abe, for this excellent lecture. Thanks, Doctor, and many thanks for audiences. Hope to see you again in next videos. But please do not forget to like and share our videos and subscribe to our YouTube channel number one, Doctor. 
Follow us on social media accounts in description below each video. With my best wishes. Dr. 8 Fomid.